Well, good morning and welcome to Christ United Reformed Church. It's good to be gathered together as the people of God to worship His name together. Uh, just uh, one announcement, you'll have noticed that handout that was out uh, in the front from the deacons, uh, just updating us on uh, some troubles that have been faced by our brothers and sisters in Iowa and the Rock Valley area. Uh, they had some severe uh, rains and uh, a levee near the town broke, and so there was some severe flooding in that area. So other area churches have been helping out, and we wanted to make you aware of that need, and the deacons are planning to take uh, an offering in the future for uh, the church is there, so that'll be in the coming weeks, but we wanted to make you aware of that need so at least you can begin to uh, pray about that situation, pray for our brothers and sisters affected by the flooding there. Our God calls us to his worship this morning with these words from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 1 and 9. O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Let us stand together that we might hear the blessing of our God. Dearly loved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And he greets us this morning with these words from the book of Galatians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's take up our Psalters together and turn to number 138, a setting of Psalm 138, 138b. With grateful heart, my thanks I bring, and we'll sing all the verses of 138b. turn our attention to the reading of God's law. The scriptures teach us that through the law comes the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. And the apostle Paul testifies, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. 
Romans 7, 7. Thus the law shows us our sin and consequently our need of Christ. So let's read the law of God together as we find it in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. And we're called to examine ourselves in the light of God's holy law. We often say it's a mirror that we hold up to see what our lives look like compared to the law, and we should see our shortcomings in love for God and love for neighbor. Uh, But it's also a window through which we see our Lord. We see his perfection in the way he loved his father and in the way he loved his neighbor. And it's in that confidence that we can come to God, knowing that we have a mediator who loves us, who loves us as he loves himself and is willing to hear his people and to mediate for them for the forgiveness of their sins. And so we should go before God's throne of grace with confidence, knowing that we have such a mediator to intercede for sinners. And so let's pray together and confess our sins and seek forgiveness in Christ's name. We're going to pray the prayer of confession that's printed in our bulletin. We'll pray that out loud, and then we'll leave time at the end for each one of us to confess silently his or her own personal sins. So let's pray this prayer together, not just with our lips, but from the heart. Let us pray. Most merciful Heavenly Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have sinned by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, Have mercy on us and forgive us. May your spirit help us to delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear our prayers, O Lord, not on account of our righteousness, but on account of your great mercy, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, dearly loved people of God, you've heard God's law and have confessed your sins to our merciful Heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit assures us with these words from John 5, 24 and 25, where Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment but he has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. It's the good news of the gospel that there is no condemnation for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ rather than the sin and and curse of death 
that it ought to have brought down upon us because of Christ's righteousness and his intervention on our behalf. We receive not the curse of eternal death, but the blessing of eternal life. This is the gift of God's grace. It can be had no other way than through faith in Jesus Christ. That's where we find hope for forgiveness of sins and an assurance that we will not come into judgment. So people of God, if you repent of your sins and believe in God's gospel promise that he grants us forgiveness of sins and eternal life by grace because of what Christ has accomplished once for all on the cross, then in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ and by the authority of his word, I assure you that your sins are forgiven you and you are not under the condemnation of God. How we need to hear that word from his throne of grace. How often we need to hear that word, that reminder of the peace we have with God through Jesus Christ. The Father has made that peace by his Son. His righteous work has been applied to our hearts by the gracious working of the Holy Spirit, changing us, making us new. And so as we reflect on our salvation, it should cause us to be reminded that it's all of God and none of us. Uh, that we bring to God only our sins and he brings us only his son. And so what can we do but sing to the praises of the God who's given us such a great salvation and let's do, do so using the words of the doxology. It's a wonderful thing to hear about the forgiveness of sins that we've received by the work of our Savior, and so we want to confess what it is that we believe. It's our response to that word, uh, that hearty confession that we make of what it is that we believe. We want to use the words of the Apostles' Creed as our, as our profession of the Catholic faith, which we mean by that small c, Catholic. It just means universal, that there is one church across all times, places, and peoples, and so this is the testimony of God's people, a witness to the gospel truth. So Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's go to our God now in a time of congregational prayer together. Let us pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, you have promised to grant our requests that we make to you in the name of your well-beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. By his teaching and that of his apostles, we have been also taught to gather together in his name. We've been given the promise that where we are gathered, he will be in the midst of us. We're thankful for that, but at the same time we recognize he is also in heaven, interceding on our behalf before you to obtain all those things for which we ask of you on earth. And so we heartily ask you, our gracious God and Father, in the name of our only Savior and mediator, to draw and lift up our thoughts and desires to you. Help us to do this in such a way as to call upon you with our whole heart and to do so agreeably to your good pleasure and perfect will. We pray to you, O Heavenly Father, for all governing authorities. They are your servants to whom you have entrusted the administration of justice. And so we pray that you would work in them so that they would do your will. We pray to you also, faithful Father and Savior, for all those you've ordained as pastors of your people. To us you have entrusted the care of souls and the ministry of the Holy Gospel. Help us to do our work well and to speak the truth with love 
and boldness. Gracious and merciful Father, we also pray for all people everywhere. It is your will to be acknowledged as the Savior of the whole world through the redemption wrought by your Son, Jesus Christ. And so grant that those who are still estranged from the knowledge of Christ would have knowledge of him. Have pity on them as they are still in the darkness and captivity of error and ignorance in which we too once walked. And we pray that you would bring them all the illumination of the Holy Spirit and the preaching of your gospel to the straight way of salvation, which is to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. And as you are the God of all comfort, we commend to you those whom you have visited with cross and tribulations, whether by poverty or prison or sickness or any other misery of the body or affliction of the spirit. Relieve their burdens, Father. Or if that is not your will, remind them that your grace is sufficient for them to endure and to overcome. And finally, O oh God and Father, grant also those who are gathered here in the name of your Son Jesus to hear his word that we may all acknowledge truly without hypocrisy what damnation should be ours by nature, what condemnation we deserve and heap upon ourselves from day to day by our unhappy and disordered lives. All of this for the purpose that Christ dwelling in us may mortify our old Adam, renewing us for a better life, by which your holy and worthy name may be exalted and glorified. Grant that everywhere and in all places we with all creatures may give you true and perfect obedience. And grant that we who walk in the love and fear of your name may be nourished by your goodness, and so supply us with all things necessary and expedient to eat our daily bread in peace. And may it please you to sustain us by your power for the time to come, so that we may not stumble because of the weakness of our flesh. Father, we ask this especially because we are of ourselves so frail that we are not able to stand fast for a single moment. And on the other hand, we are continually beset and assailed by so many enemies, the devil, the world, sin, and our own flesh. And these enemies never cease to make war upon us. And so, Father, strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit and arm us with your grace that we may be able to resist all temptations firmly and persevere in this spiritual battle until we shall attain full victory and triumph at last in your kingdom with our captain and protector, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now have the opportunity to worship God with our gifts and offerings. The offering this morning is for the general fund.
want to turn to our song of preparation, which is number 55, 55, hear my cry, oh, hear my cry for mercy. I'll get it right eventually. Uh, number 55, oh, hear my cry for mercy. Uh, we're going to sing it to a different tune, a little more familiar tune, and uh, Catherine's been kind enough to put the lyrics with the music on the next page of the bulletin. So on pages 7 and 8, you'll find uh, the right words with the right tune. So if that's important to you, uh, it's right there. If you can't read music and it makes no difference to you, you can just turn to number 55 in the hymnal. Uh, but we'll all sing this song together. Uh, it's not quite as dark as Psalm 88 was last week that we sang as a song of preparation, but this is a song of persecution that speaks of betrayal. And as the Lord is betrayed this, e this morning in our text from Mark 14 uh, on the evening, he was arrested. Uh, we wanted to think about this in connection with his betrayal and arrest. So we're going to sing 55, all the verses. Let's stand and sing together. Oh, he, oh hear my cry for mercy.
As we go to open God's word together, let's ask him to bless it to us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, your Son taught us that it is the Spirit who gives life and that the flesh is no help at all. And Jesus told us clearly that the words he has spoken to us are spirit and life, but that no one can come to him unless it is granted to him by you. And so we humbly ask you to open the glorious gates of righteousness to us by your Spirit. Through his word, may we enter in and come to your beloved Son. Give us life through faith in Christ and willing hearts to serve him always. And hear us, for we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please be seated. And please turn with me in God's word to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're glad to have you here today. We've been considering a series through the book of Mark, and we've come to chapter 14 at verse 43. So verses 43 through 52 will be our sermon text this morning. Uh, that passage is found on many of our pew Bibles at page 1083. Uh, Mark is the second book of the New Testament between Matthew and Luke. So Mark chapter 14, our text will be verses 43 to 52, but to remind ourselves of the context, I want to back up a couple verses and begin our reading at verse 41. So let's begin our reading at Mark 14, at verse 41, and let's pay careful attention for this is God's own word. And he, that is Jesus, came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Thus far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to us. Well, this is the day that Jesus had been telling his disciples was coming for quite a long time. If we go back through the Gospel of Mark, it's been a while since we've considered some of these passages, but again and again, Jesus had taught them uh, that this day was coming. Uh, Back in Mark 8.31, we read, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And again in Mark 9.31, We read, he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. And then one more example from Mark 10, 33 to 34. See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Uh, Jesus has been warning his disciples and teaching them that this day was coming. Um, And now that dark day of which our Lord has spoken uh, comes to pass here in our text. As he is betrayed into the hands of sinners and arrested by those who seek to kill him. And so we want to think about this passage this morning and think in particularly about three things. First, to look at the Savior's arrest. Uh, then to think about the Savior's abandonment, and finally to think about the Savior's assurance, uh, the assurance that he gives us even in the midst of this dark passage. And so that's how we want to think about this, the Savior's arrest, the Savior's abandonment, and the Savior's assurance. Uh, We have the Savior's arrest here, and it begins with the treachery of Judas in betraying the Lord into their hands. This, of course, happens just as the Lord had predicted it would happen. Uh, He had predicted this just a few verses earlier in verses 18 and 20, uh, that Judas would betray him, that one of the 12 uh, would turn him over. 
And you remember that it sparked a lot of uh, the disciples saying, well, surely that's not me. I'm not the one who's going to do that. Um, but Judas had already made plans to betray the Lord at an opportune time. And Jesus knew before Judas arrived that he was going to do this. Uh, that's why we backed up and started our reading at verse 41. It's a reminder that Jesus said, my betrayer is at hand before he'd even arrived. Uh, the Lord knew what was going to take place. He had divine knowledge of all of these things. Um, and it's also because this betrayal happens just as the scriptures had foretold it would. It's an important fact that we will return to again and again in this passage that everything that's happening here is to fulfill the divine plan of God according to the words that God had spoken a long time in the past. Uh, this is all predicted in the scriptures. Even the betrayal of Judas is foretold in the scriptures. We thought about Psalm 41 uh, that talks about he who dipped the bread with me is betraying me, has lifted up his heel against me. Um, and we also sang Psalm 55 for that reason, because it's a psalm of betrayal. Uh, psalm 55, 12 to 14 says, It is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together. Within God's house, we walked in the throng. How true that was of Judas and Jesus, that they had walked together in the temple. Judas hearing the word of God and even ministering with him. But Psalm 55 goes on to say in verse 20, My companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil yet they were drawn swords. And isn't that what we see of Judas here? Um, he comes and talks to Jesus as a close disciple and friend would, calls him rabbi, uh, greets him with familiarity in that common greeting of the time, but a common greeting that showed that one was a disciple of a master, calls him rabbi, they, they look from outward appearance like the acts of a close disciple and friend, but we know that they are in reality something entirely different. The acts of an enemy and a devil. He did this to identify Jesus to those who would arrest him. And in that way, he is clearly fulfilling the words of Psalm 55 because war was in his heart and his words were a drawn sword. And so Judas plays the role that the Lord has set for him as betrayer. And with that, this gospel has no further use for him. Uh, he fades out of Mark's gospel. We don't hear anything more of him. Uh, the only thing we know of his future is what the Lord had said back in verse 21. Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man had he not been born. And that's certainly also what Psalm 55 bears out. Uh, what is the fate that awaits someone who does this, who betrays in this way? Well, Psalm 55, 15 says, Of such people, let death steal over them. Let them go down to Sheol alive. For evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. And in verse 23, But you, O God, will cast them down into the pit of destruction, Men of blood and treachery shall not live out half their days. And that was certainly true of Judas. He did not live much longer than this. It's a reminder that Hebrews 10.31 is exactly right. That it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we must shudder at this betrayal. Um, and take it to heart. So that we would only kiss the son with love and reverent fear. Kiss him the way that we are commanded to kiss him in Psalm 2, verse 12. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in his way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. There's no one who kisses the son in love and reverent fear that has anything to fear from him. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. And so Judas fades and his act of betrayal is served its purpose, which is to deliver the Lord into the hands of the Jewish religious authorities. 
uh, this arrest party comes with the authority of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of God's people at the time, made up of these three groups that, J- that Jesus lists for us here, or that the text lists for us here, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Uh, Jesus particularly had said in Mark 8, 31, it would be these people who arrest him and sought to kill him. Um, and here they are doing exactly what he predicted they would do. Uh, this is emphasizing that this is not a Gentile arrest party. Uh, these are the Jewish religious leaders that have come out against Jesus in this way. They have come to enact that plot that was announced at the beginning of this chapter to arrest him by stealth and to kill him. Um, and they certainly come as if they are expecting violent resistance. Uh, even Judas's words to them seem to betray that that's what he was expecting. You know, I'll identify him too, and you, you arrest him and hold him close because you don't know what they might do in response. And so they come ready to meet violent resistance. The arrest party comes with armed with swords and clubs. Um, and it's really to this treatment that Jesus objects. Right? It's, it's interesting what our Lord says in verse 48 for a number of reasons, but as they come like this to arrest him, uh, Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Um, I'm being treated like I'm a robber, not like I'm a rabbi. What reason have I ever given you to think that violent resistance is what I'm here to do? Um, how do you come at me with, in this way? And he says, I'm not, I'm not really a stranger to you. I mean, you were there day after day as I was teaching in the temple. Um, I, I was there teaching day after day. I, I wasn't hiding anything. I was walking among you. You saw what I did. Did I ever give you reason to think I was here to commit a violent overthrow of you or the government? Um, You had the opportunity to arrest me all the time when I was in the temple if I'm such a threat. And this is how you come at me. One person put it this way, the contrast between the surprised armed attack by night and Jesus' daily appearance in the temple shows these precautions to be unwarranted and unnecessary. But this is, in a sense, the continuing deepening of our Lord's humiliation and suffering. For the Lord of life to be treated as if he's some kind of common violent criminal. In that sense, there's never been anyone who's been treated more unjustly. Or more someone who has been less who have been subjected to this kind of treatment less than our Lord and Savior. Um, He's the only person in the history of the world who has only ever perfectly loved his neighbor as he loved himself. Uh, That's who he was, and now he's being treated as if he's some kind of violent menace to society. When the Holy Spirit testified about him in Isaiah 53, 9, and they made his grave with the wicked and a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. To treat the righteous one as if he is a violent robber is a shameful disgrace, but this too fulfills what the scriptures had said about him. The Holy Spirit also said in Isaiah 53 that he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. And it's ironic that they come at him like this because when Jesus reminds us of his daily teaching in the temple, which is not that long ago in the book of Mark, um, we can remember what he said when he was teaching in the temple. In Mark eleven seventeen 17 and 18, we read, and he was teaching them and saying to them, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders... He was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? Who were the robbers? It was them. And if there's any doubt about that, we hear it in how they reacted to his words to them. The very next verse says, And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. Who are the violent ones? Who are the robbers? It's those who've come out against the Lord. Who think that they are doing something to serve God and society 
by silencing him. And if we think about it, I think we can still say that people still call Jesus a robber and still treat him as if he were a robber. His church goes out into the world and in his name preaches Christ crucified. The good news that through faith in Jesus Christ we can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. He gives that to us freely. And we preach the call to spend our lives responding to his gracious gift in gratitude. Loving him, serving our neighbors in love, loving them as we love ourselves. And people hear his gospel and what's preached in his name, and they still say he's a robber. That his doctrine robs me of my freedom to live the way I want. Robs me of my autonomy to live my own way in the world. He would take that away from me. My freedom, my autonomy, my right to control my own life and be the captain of my own destiny. And they fundamentally misunderstand who he is as if he comes to take and doesn't come to give. How do we know that he is no robber? He tells us in John 10.10 how we know that he is no robber. The thief comes only to kill and destroy. Isn't that true? The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, what have they wanted about Jesus over and over to kill and destroy him. That's how we know that they are robbers. The thief comes only to kill, only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life, and that abundantly. Right? That's what Jesus comes to do. He doesn't come to take, he comes to give. He comes to take away the things we don't want our sin, our condemnation, and comes to give us the things that we desperately need, remission of sins and eternal life. He's not a thief that comes to steal and to kill and destroy. He's the Lord of life who comes that we would have life and that abundantly. And because of that's who he is, It not only makes his arrest so shameful, but it also makes his abandonment so tragic. Because we see after the Savior's arrest, the Savior's abandonment. When at first he's arrested, there is a kind of futile resistance uh, to try to serve the Lord. One of his disciples, we know from the other Gospels that it's Peter, uh, demonstrates that what they'd said about being willing to die was not all idle talk. Sometimes we act that way as if, you know, the disciples talked a big game. They didn't mean any of it. Well, when he's faced with an armed mob with swords and clubs, this disciple draws his sword and attacks. Um, I don't think he's necessarily unwilling to die. He shows a willingness to fight. The problem is not his willingness to fight and die. The problem is he fights for Jesus but without Jesus. Right? He fights for Jesus. He, he's willing to die, but that's not what Jesus is asking him to do. And that's not Jesus' purpose. Right? What does Jesus intend to do? He does not intend to resist. He intends to willingly give himself up to arrest and death and humiliation so that he might save his people. And so here is one who fights for Jesus and maybe even is willing to die for Jesus, but he's fighting without Jesus. And I think this is a reminder to the church as well. Maybe particularly it's a needed word to the church in America. We're willing to fight and die for Jesus, but if you're fighting without Jesus, if your fight is not his fight, you're not going to accomplish anything. This, this, this disciple strikes out boldly, and what does he accomplish? He cuts off an ear. And we know from the other Gospels that that didn't even do any lasting damage because the Lord healed that ear. It shows the futility of trying to fight for Jesus without him. To have your own cause that's not the Lord's cause. It ends up with futility. 
He manages to cut off an ear. He doesn't do anything to break the hold that the arrest party has on the Lord. And after that feudal resistance is attempted, and after they see that Jesus does not intend to resist, we're told they abandon him. It's emphatic in the Greek. And leaving him, they fled all of them. The all is emphatic. There's not anyone who's willing to stand by him. When they see he won't resist, they all flee in terror. What does that tell us? They might have been willing to fight with him, and they might have been willing to die with him. But they weren't willing to be arrested with him. They weren't willing to suffer with him. They might have been willing to fight and die, but they weren't willing to go to the cross. They weren't willing to submit themselves to suffering and death. And I think that too is something we ought to pause and consider. Because I think the church has often had a problem with this too. We're willing to fight and die, but are we willing to suffer? Are we willing to bear the cross? Calvin, writing hundreds of years ago, illustrated this problem with the church. He said, hence it is again evident that we are much more courageous and ready for fighting than for cross-bearing. And therefore we ought always to deliberate wisely what the Lord commands, lest the fervor of our zeal exceed the bounds of reason and moderation. This lone disciple improperly attempts more than the calling of God commands or permits. And I think he's exactly right about that in the church in every generation. We're often way more courageous to fight than we are to cross bear, than we are to suffer. And here we see that no one is willing to suffer with him. They all abandon him. None of them are willing to bear the cross. And we read that sad summary, they all fled. This is what Jesus predicted would happen back in verse 27. You will all fall away. This is what all the disciples had denied would happen. Oh, no, no. If we need to, we'll die with you. Um, but they all leave him. One person put it pointedly, poignantly, all drank of the cup of the new covenant in his blood, all pledged to die with him, all desert him. They all fall away. And I think the completeness of the Lord's abandonment is seen in these final two verses, which only Mark recounts in his gospel, in verses 51 and 52. Um, this has been a perplexing passage for many. Many people have tried to identify this person. Many people have tried to sort of build this up into some big spiritual analogy or story. I think all of that is kind of silliness. I think the reformer Heinrich Bullinger was right when he said, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't tell us who this is. If we needed to know who it is, he would have told us. He doesn't tell us, so it's not important to know who he is. It's important to pay attention to what he does. Um, that's why this story is offered, not to make us speculate, is this Mark concerning himself? Is this the Apostle John? Who is this? It doesn't really matter who it is. It's what he does that our attention is focused on. Because at first, he seems to be one who continues to attempt to follow Jesus. A young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. Uh, that, that, that description expresses the value of this cloth. And he attempted to follow Jesus, but what happened? When they seized him and meant to take him along where Jesus was going... He shows that he's so desperate to part ways from the Lord that he'd rather leave this expensive cloth behind and run away naked than go with Jesus. It's meant to sort of highlight the totalness of our Lord's abandonment. That this guy would rather give up what's rich and rather run off naked than go where Jesus is going. It's emphasizing the point that everyone left him and everyone was desperate to get away, get away from him. 
like how one person put it, the story of this young man reinforces a scene in which the ruling impulse is the desperate impulse to save one's own skin. The mood of every man for himself, which ensures that the, the, that the desertion of Jesus is given a hard-hitting climax. It makes the utter aloneness with which Jesus then goes to the cross all the more terrible by contrast. What is the ruling impulse here? I got to save myself. And if that means getting away from Jesus, I'm going to go to save myself. And this, again, pr pr proves the Lord's prediction of verse 27, fulfills the prophecy of Zechariah 13, 7, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And the Lord is not only left alone, but he's left alone in the hands of sinners who mean to kill him. That's the nature of this abandonment. Um, and so, what, what can we take away in terms of encouragement from this passage? Um, I think we could take encouragement from the assurance the Savior gives us in this passage. The Savior's assurance is where we want to leave ourselves in this because throughout this scene Jesus is in total control of what happens right he announced it would happen before it happened as it takes place he's the only one who meets it with a steely resolve he even speaks with a certain authority to this party that's armed with swords and clubs I like how one pastor put it, he said, commenting on how the Lord speaks to this arrest party, he said, with all its calmness and patience, our Lord's response is majestic and authoritative. It sounds as if spoken from a height far above this hubbub. Isn't that how the Lord seems to speak here? As if he can just have a conversation with this mob that's come to arrest him and take him away to his death. What's happening here? I think it's this. The Lord is maintaining a heavenly perspective on this earthly chaos. He sees it for what he is. And of course, he can do that because he's fully God. But I think we're seeing here that even in his humanity, he rests his assurance squarely on the shoulders of the scriptures. Right, when he says, what, what are you doing? Why are, why are you coming here with swords and clubs? What, what evidence have I ever given you that you would need swords and clubs to arrest me? I was with you day by day in the temple. You know me. You know what I did. But where does he end that statement? Let the scriptures be fulfilled. Let the scriptures be fulfilled. The Lord knows what all of this is about. And what he's reminding all of us is that as awful and terrible as all these events are, Jesus is saying, this is all decreed by my Father and was declared long ago by the Spirit. The scriptures bear witness to all of this. This, plan, this was all decreed by my Father. It was all declared by the Holy Spirit. There's no surprise in any of this. There's no real, any true chaos in any of this. Everything that happens, as Peter will put it on the day of Pentecost, happens here according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. What Jesus does is lifts his eyes above this earthly chaos and sees the divine plan that's behind it all. The plan of his father, the father who loves him and knows that he has planned everything that's happening here. Even the betrayal of Jesus is part of the plan of his father. The arrest of Jesus is part of the plan of his father. And because it's part of his divine plan, he knows there's a divine purpose in all of it. A purpose beyond the abandonment and the arrest and the shameful treatment. There's a purpose his father is working out in all of this. And he knows that because this is fulfilling the scriptures fulfilling the decree of the Father that's been declared by the Holy Spirit since the beginning of the Word. That he knows that all of his Father's plans are going to override the plans of the wicked. 
and all of the evil purposes that they seek to do by these things, he will thwart and turn to his holy purpose. Their plans are not interfering with the Father's plan. And it's their purposes that will not work out. It's the Father's purpose that will work out in all of this. And what, is, what are the Father's plans and purposes? What are they always doing in the world? They're always serving the end of glorifying his name and doing good to his people. When we lift up our eyes and see that divine plan, we recognize who our Father is and who the Holy Spirit has always declared him to be. Someone who has a plan in all things for his glory and for our good. That's why we, so many of us hold those words of Jeremiah 29, 11 to be so precious. For the Lord declares, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. And if we're ever tempted to, to say, well, you know, that just applied to what Jeremiah was saying to a people that were in exile, and, and you know, that doesn't really apply. But, you know, that, that was a small sh- screenshot of what God does more broadly, a small snapshot of who God is. Yes, he was that for that people coming out of exile, but he's always been that for his people. And that's the encouragement we can take, that God is working out a plan. And what is that plan? Plan for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and to give you hope. Do you see how without what Christ does here, there is no future for us. There is no hope for us. Apart from a Savior who's willing to go and do what's necessary for his people. To suffer and die in their place. And that's why there is no better picture of God's glory and of our good than in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is more glorious than a God who would give him to us, unworthy sinners that we are? Um, We we should marvel at that from time to time. Right? There's a poet who said, What did thou spy in this impure, rebellious clay that made thee thus resolve to die for those who kill thee every day? And his conclusion is, it was love. Only love could do that. Could make a savior resolve to die for a people like us. It's where God's highest glory and and our highest good meet in the person and work of our loving Savior. That's what God is doing. And Jesus knows that this has been decreed by his Father and has been declared through the ages by the Holy Spirit that there is a saving purpose for the people of God being worked out here. As Isaiah would say, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. There's a saving purpose declared by the Holy Spirit and a glorifying purpose for the Son, for the, for the servant who is willing to serve his Father in this way. That he knew the truth of what the Holy Spirit had said, that out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him with a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. All this has been declared by the decreed by the Father. It's been declared by the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus says, let the scriptures be fulfilled. What my Father has decreed and what the Holy Spirit has declared, I am determined to deliver. That's the assurance we can have from the Lord here. 
that plan of salvation, he is determined to deliver for his people, to prove that word true. And because of that, we can draw great assurance that our Lord was determined where all others were determined just to get away from this faith. And for the joy that was set before him, he goes forward to endure the cross, despising its shame, knowing that by serving the will of his Father, it will end in the Father highly exalting him and bestowing on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess on heaven and earth that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. So he says, let the scriptures be fulfilled. And then he goes and he fulfills them all. What a savior we have. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord Jesus Christ doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Praise the Lord for such a savior and his determination to fulfill the word of God. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are amazed that you should love sinners like us and have a plan for our good, people who have so badly rebelled against you. And what a savior we have who is willing to go through what he went through to provide that salvation. We see in his abandonment just how unwilling we are to bear crosses. We would much rather fight and die than suffer. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be mindful of the fact that you have called us to be a cross-bearing people. We pray that we would be willing to follow what you command and what you decree and to walk in your ways, not on our own. Keep us from the futility of fighting for you, but without you. And we thank you for our Savior who fought the fight that needed to be fought for us. Despite all of his power, he was willing to lay down his life and to hand it over into the hands of robbers who would seek to kill and destroy him. We thank you for his willingness to do what was necessary for our salvation. We thank you that in him we find our highest good and your highest glory. May we put our faith and trust in him. Hear us, we pray in his name. Think of our soldiers once again, and as a song of response, turn to number 352, Man of Sorrows, What a Name. We'll stand together and sing all the verses of 352.
Dearly loved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, lift up your hearts now to the Lord and receive his blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. People of God, go in peace.